Let's talk about big stick energy. Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scotland Gladiator, and I've got a big stick. Um, and I've got some other sticks here. Um, there's a, a knob carry, a form of it. It's actually a walking stick, but in knob carry form. There's a truncheon. We're going to talk about these sorts of things. And as with many things on the internet that I like to rant about, when we have uh, try, people trying to redress and imbalance and correct information, they often go too far in the other direction and create a new mythology. And the new mythology here is that a stick is somehow the ultimate weapon. Um, and that it is somehow more powerful than more conventional weapons you might find on a medieval or renaissance or ancient world battlefield. And I want to redress that uh, misconception and pull it back the other way and find a more realistic middle ground. But before I go on, I want to have a super quick word to you about the awesome sponsors for this video who are Mech Arena. Mech Arena is the awesome 5v5 arena fighting game between giant mechs with awesome weapons and awesome armour. And any of you who've played mobile games will be familiar with that O2 familiar feeling where you come up against a big pay-to-play player who completely wipes the floor with you and you don't stand a chance. Well, Mech Arena is a bit different to that because it's skill-based and ultimately you get better by practicing and additionally by actually playing you get all sorts of rewards. So it's free to download, free to play and just by playing you stand a better chance chance of winning with your team. That's right, Mech Arena is free to play and rewards players who actually play and practice. So that means that you can progress your mechs, your weapons, your game modes, the arenas you have access to. You can actually get access to those things by playing more. There are absolutely tons of free to play ways of getting rewards such as special events and daily objectives. So two pieces of advice for taking on more powerful mechs. Hide a lot, use the environment, use the landscape, hide behind walls and boxes and this kind of stuff. And also, don't go off on your own. Don't go ramboing it. Stay with other teammates because some of them will be a lot more experienced than you and maybe have more powerful mechs than you. So band together and outnumber the opponents. Divide and conquer. You can see here that one of the tactics I used to take on a more powerful mech was simply to charge in and ram and then stay very, very close to them. I knew they had more powerful guns than me, so stay close and keep popping around, shooting them as much as possible and moving around close to them so they can't get their guns to bear on me. One of the great things about Mech Arena is everyone's on an even playing field to start with. So it's skill based very, very much. So there are loads of awesome events going on right now that you can jump straight into, including lots of chances to get hold of awesome new weapons. And the hot topic at the moment is the disc launcher. Also being that it's October, there's a bunch of Halloween events you can get involved with, including uh, rewards, which are Halloween skins. And in addition to that, that there's an awesome login rewards system going on at the moment which you definitely don't want to miss out on. So Mech Arena is completely free to play, free to download and you can play it on Android or iOS and you can download it using my link below or the QR code on the screen right now. And if you do that you'll get one desert digital skin, 200 A coins and 10,000 credits to help kickstart your game. If you're quick you can add me to your friends, my name's Context of course, and maybe we can play some games together. So don't wait around, go and give Mech Arena a try right now. So so thanks for sticking with me. Now, the first point at which we're going to go in and talk about big stick energy and the what I think is the the counter truth um, and the new mythology about big sticks and how amazingly awesome they are. Now, the first time that this bothered me was some years ago in HEMA when a lot of people started picking up quarter staffs. That's why I'm holding this particularly long stick here. In fact, this is probably longer. <laughs> I can't. I can only just about reach the top of it. This is probably longer than most of you think of as a quarter staff. But a little bit of a newsflash for some of you. Um, actually, some quarter staffs were this long. We're about. I don't know how long that is, seven, eight, eight feet, seven and a half, eight feet long. Um, and this is normally what people think of as spear length. Now, in fact, staffs of various sort have taken many lengths over time. There was a particular fashion at one point in the 17th century for walking around with sticks that are about the same length as a uh, long, long sword or a two-handed sword. So kind of chest or face height. Um, so that was one particular uh, popular length and that has survived in certain uh, cane combat systems, La Can uh, and Grand Can and things like this, which survived into the 19th and in fact 19th century I was going to say, but they're still in fact practiced today with a continuous lineage in some places. Um, lots of other people who watch Robin, Robin Hood films would think about a quarterstaff as about the same height as a person. 
Now, one thing, I'm just going to uh, diverge slightly for a second. One thing, if you watch movies, that you'll often see is people holding a staff in the middle and using both ends equally. Okay, now that was done historically. Uh, however, it's actually probably statistically in the minority. Most people who use quarterstaffs, whether we're talking about Japan or China or uh, medieval Europe, Renaissance Europe, whatever, most people who use quarterstaffs. Um, historically used a staff that was at least as tall as them and usually a bit taller, usually closer to spear length. And importantly, they're usually hitting the ceiling there, they usually held it at the back end. So, uh, whether you're aware of this or not, from the uh, end of the 16th century onwards, we actually have a bunch of quarterstaff manuals or treatises uh, telling us how to use quarterstaffs and they exist in non-English languages but there are some English ones as well so you can literally go and study 18th century quarterstaff if you want and typically they hold it with a little bit of staff sticking out the back and most of the staff sticking out the front and that is the typical way to use a quarterstaff with either hand forward and they switch hands uh, so most of the weapon is used with this end now the first time that I became aware of the over um, accentuation of big stick energy is amongst the quarterstaff fraternity. Uh, now, you may not have been aware that there is even such a thing, but there is indeed. There are quarterstaff fanboys and fangirls out there, <laughs> okay? Now, I don't want to say that the course stuff isn't a really cool weapon. The course stuff is a cool weapon. We've got treatises for it, different systems. There's a grand can, there's you know, different lengths, different styles. Very, very diverse ways of using quarterstaffs, obviously from Asia, Africa, Europe, and all over. So it's a very, very cool weapon. And most important and most cool about the weapon is it's just a stick. It's just a long stick, and it doesn't even need to be a perfectly uh, you know, straight-hewn piece of ash like this is. Um, but it can be any old rough stick that will hold together. Uh, it could be something you cut down yourself in the forest. That's one of the great things. They can't really be legally... Uh, prohibited, at least not very easily, because they grow. There's, you go into any forest and you're surrounded by quarterstaffs. So that's one of the reasons, undoubtedly, that quarterstaffs are one of the most ubiquitous and universal weapons, um, certainly since weapon legislation has been a thing in many, many countries around the world since the ancient period. Because no matter what the weapon legislations are, whatever rules they make about, oh, carrying swords, you mustn't carry a sword in the city, blah, 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 or you can't walk around with a knife on your belt or bowie knife in Texas, surprisingly, and all these kinds of things, they can't legislate against you walking around with a long stick uh, because long sticks are everywhere uh, and you can quickly go and get one. You don't necessarily, if you're anywhere near a forest you don't, or bamboo uh, bushes, you don't necessarily even need to carry one around. If you've got a knife or some way of breaking one down or cutting one down, you can easily get a quarter staff should you need one. So, they are really cool weapons. Now, where people overstate um, how cool they are is in their power okay so for some reason and I, you know George Silver has a part in this and undoubtedly and there are certain other apocryphal tales from the 16th and 17th centuries of people using quarter staves against groups of people with rapiers and this kind of stuff people overstate the power of a quarter staff now I'm not saying it's weak okay this isn't Matt Easton says that he can take a blow from a quarter staff to the head and shrug it off no it is a long lever okay but let's put this in context Okay, this is a long stick, just like loads of other weapons that are long levers. Okay, a two handed sword is a almost as long lever and heavier and sharper. Um, a, a, a bill or, or a spear is a long stick with a thing on the end. A danax is uh, here's one, there you go. A danax is a semi long stick with an axe blade on it. So, those things are equally long sticks but with more offensive bits on them and I'm going to come back to that. So quarterstaff can hit fast, it, it hit hard rather, and it can hit fast. It is a relatively light and nimble weapon but people I believe have overstated how powerful the quarterstaff is and I believe that there are uh, three main reasons why a quarterstaff is not a weapon you see on the medieval or renaissance battlefield with any regularity at all. So what are those three main reasons? Number one, if you're going to carry a weapon of this kind of size and length, 
why not carry a spear or a bill or a halberd or a glaive or anything like that, okay? The simple fact is that if you're going to inconvenience yourself with this kind of thing carrying around, it is because you want to use a long weapon and that long weapon has a tactical purpose on the battlefield you're fighting on. And that purpose can only be improved and enhanced by adding some type of offensive head um, or, or spikes even to this. So absolutely, in medieval and renaissance art, we do see staff weapons of numerous different types and I've done loads of videos on staff weapons particularly spears but I've also looked a lot at bills and halberds and glaives um, and things like this so absolutely if you're if you're gonna go to war why not absolutely have the advantages of a quarter staff plus even more advantages of the bladed weapon that you stick on the end of it or spikes indeed and very uh, occasionally we do see these large cudgels essentially, okay? And the other thing to say as well is that there are sometimes what I would call, and that's what these large cudgels come into, enhanced staffs. So we do know, for example, that there was a type of um, iron shod, so you put iron bands around the shaft, uh, and that is to make them more effective at hitting, okay? quite easily. Now, one of the problems there you get is in a civilian environment, if you start putting pieces of iron on your uh, pole weapon, on your sh shafted weapon, staff weapon, then you start to get into legal ramifications. And indeed, there were legal restrictions on walking around a city with a uh, pole arm with a staff weapon because that was seen as a weapon of war. If you start putting pieces of iron on your simple stick, you can't go, oh, it's just a stick to the policeman. Uh, he will go, no, that's got a bloody great spike on it. But if we look at art from the medieval and renaissance period, we do indeed see sometimes people using what we could call enhanced staffs. And one of the most famous examples of that, apart from the spiked cudgel or spiked staff, is indeed the uh, golden dag, okay? And the golden dag is nothing really but a tapered um, quarterstaff which has a particularly bulbous end with iron around it and a spike at the end. So therefore you're getting the advantages of being able to stab with the thing more effectively to ward off cavalry used famously by the Flemish, of course, to do exactly that. And of course, you've got a stronger striking hitting end. So the first reason um, why we don't see these on the medieval and renaissance battlefield is because you can easily add spikes or weights or blades or whatever to the end of this, and it becomes a staff weapon, which is the standard weapon of that period. Now, the next reason I believe why we don't really see these used very much on the medieval or renaissance battlefield is essentially they're not, uh, they're not very uh, useful at all against armor. Really, you only need to, whilst absolutely, uh, you know, a blow to the head from a quarter staff can be a horrible thing that will drop you to the ground like a sack of potatoes, definitely. But all you have to do is put on a simple helmet and that doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> yes, okay, the quarter staff does hit with a fair amount of power, but armor instantly negates that, okay? If you, if you just throw a simple helmet on, which has been around since the ancient period, this uh, does absolutely nothing to my head at all. I can barely even feel it, although I can definitely hear it. Okay, the fact is that this now becomes completely benign in an environment where people are wearing helmets and even just, uh, you know, Paddy Gambersons. You don't even need a lot of armor. You start to put any kind of protective gear on, which a lot of people on battlefields in this period did, and this becomes a particularly useless <laughs> stick. Um, and uh, hence the blades and the spikes and the hooks and all of the things that we get on staff weapons, okay? So this becomes benign against people in armor. In a civilian environment, fine, effective, okay? Break the arm, concuss the head, whatever. But the simple fact is, any armour involved, it's not very effective. Now the third reason why I believe that these weren't seen very much on the medieval or renaissance battlefield at all, at least without some uh, head or um, spike or whatever on them, is quite simply, even by itself, this is not a very offensive weapon. Now, I've spoken about the use of walking sticks. I'll just put the giant quarterstaff down for a second. I've spoken about the use of walking sticks in self-defense, okay? Now, self-defense is a very different uh, situation to warfare, yeah? Um, so clearly there's some crossover and there's some skills. So if you learn the martial arts skills that are used, you know, parrying, avoiding, moving around, uh, how to give blows effectively, this kind of stuff, if you learn all of these things, that's, you can use that in a self-defense situation, or you can use it in a, in fact, you could use it in a sport situation, in a fencing situation, uh, or you could use it on a battlefield, okay? So you can use the skills in all of those things. But these sticks, quite simply, 
actually aren't very offensive. To kill someone with a stick is not especially easy, whereas to kill someone with a little knife, if you stab it in the right place, quite easy, okay? And as a demonstration of that, I've got here a policeman's truncheon. And quite simply, these are, and have been for a long time, common instruments of law and order, partly because, yes, you can hurt someone, you can subdue someone who's unarmed, but they're not very effective weapons. You're not going to accidentally kill someone. Well, I mean, it can statistically happen, I suppose, but by and large, you're not going to accidentally, grievously, um, you know, injure or kill someone with a little truncheon like this because it's a stick. Yes, it'll hurt. Yes, you can break bones with it. Yes, you can knock someone out with it, but it's not a super effective weapon. If we just compare this little stick here with, I don't know, this little warhammer here, okay, eh, the warhammer's a bit longer, but you can make it shorter. Clearly, that one is a lot easier to completely kill someone with than a little stick here is. So, sticks by themselves are not particularly effective. Obviously, some of you will be crying, ah, oh, but what about the quarter staff? You can totally break bones and do grievous things to people with a big quarter staff. Yeah, you can, but I want to throw something else into the mix here as well. So as well as saying that these aren't really very effective against armor, this would be pretty much uh, ineffective against armor. And at this point, I'll just throw in, think about modern uh, recreational reenactment type um, activities such as the SCA. Um, such as uh, sort of Battle of the Nations type stuff. Equally, if you think about um, even things like Kendo and Hema, um, if you think about uh, other, other martial arts from around the world, generally speaking, a stick is often the practice weapon. Why is the stick the practice weapon? Because the stick doesn't kill people. And you put on a little bit of protection, a padded jacket and a helmet, and the stick becomes completely benign. But there is another elephant in the room here, and that is that sticks are particularly easy to counter. What do I mean by that? Well, quite simply, if someone is attacking you with a truncheon, you can basically wrestle them, okay? You can soak up one or two hits, you can stick your arm in the way, yes, it might get broken, whatever, and even, much to some people's annoyance, I even pointed this out with the quarter staff, and they said, but your arm will get totally broken. Yes, it, it might do, but if you do it right, if you close in and you come in at the right angles and you come in with the right timing, then hopefully it won't. But the simple fact is that it is a lot easier to grapple with someone, or indeed to grab one of these, than it even is to do against a tiny little open L pocket knife, okay? If someone's coming at you with a little knife, it's very difficult to get hold of and control that. If someone's coming in at you with a truncheon, it's actually a lot easier to come in and control that. And this is one of the disadvantages of pole weapons as well, of course, because whilst they have a lot of reach and a lot of re uh, um, leverage and all of the other advantages over swords that I often point out, one of the disadvantages of pole arms is you can grab them. And all of the manuals and treatises t tell us to do this, whether it's against a halberd or a pole axe in the medieval period, or whether it's against a bayonet in the age of firearms. Grabbing the shaft is a great thing to do, folks. I recommend you grab the shaft as often as possible. So, grabbing, countering, grappling against the stick, much, much more easy. So, sticks absolutely do have some advantages in a self-defense situation. They can move very fast. They can, you know, you can cover yourself against things. You can actually reach quite a long way and you can, uh, in an unarmored in civilian environment, you can uh, maybe put someone out of the fight by hitting their hand or their arm really hard if they're holding a knife, for example, um, so that they can't use that limb anymore. Indeed, you can thrust with them to the face as well or throat, um, and you can whack them around the head um, hard enough to maybe put them out of the fight to enable you to get away. But compared to real battlefield weapons, they've they're problematic, okay? They don't, they don't hit particularly hard. Uh, they don't penetrate uh, or overcome armor in any real, uh, very effective way. And they can be grappled and grabbed and disarmed more easily than things like swords and pole axes and halberds. So there we go. I don't want people who love sticks and love stick systems uh, to be upset by this video. I do as well. I think sticks are great, um, whether it's walking stick size things. I love like truncheons as well. And of course, um, quarterstaff is absolutely fantastic in all its many forms and uh, from around the world, different systems, different lengths, um, and so on and so forth. Um, so absolutely, 
in that form, big stick energy is definitely a thing. But I think we do need an injection of context here, and particularly when we're comparing sticks to other weapons, we need a little bit of a reality check, I think, and to remind ourselves that sticks weren't, by and large, uh, used as you know main battlefield weapons when there were other options available. Yes, absolutely, forms of club um, were used, but remember, a club is is an augmented stick. It has a weighted head, and the the knob carries, for example, used uh, by Zulus in war usually had a much bigger head than this. Um, and their principal weapon, of course, was the spear. Uh, it wasn't necessarily uh, the club. The club was more or less a backup for most of them. Um, at, but you know, in some places, if we go to um, uh, pre-colonial uh, New Zealand, for example. Um, the Maoris used lots of different types of wooden weapons uh, with some funky shapes. Essentially, they are clubs, they are big sticks, they are awesome. Uh, they also had stone weapons and other types of stuff. I'll talk about Maori weapons in another video, I'm sure. Um, so absolutely, in some places, they did just use forms of stick or wooden weapon as weapons, but of course, they didn't have access to metal. But certainly when we're talking about a medieval European or Renaissance uh, context, or we're talking about a Japanese um, battlefield context or anything like that, by and large, anywhere that has access to metal um, and anywhere that has any sorts of body protection and armour, sticks just don't cut it, quite literally. <laughs> uh, you need something that can overcome armour um, in places where any type of armour is used, and indeed, if you can stick a, a blade or a spearhead or whatever on top of one of these or it spikes or anything else, then you generally do because why wouldn't you? Okay, um, so there we go. I hope this has been somewhat thought provoking. Uh, your comments and insights below are always appreciated. Uh, so get posting and I will see you in the comments section. Thanks for watching, folks, and I'll see you again soon. Cheers. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.